Logos and Trivigal podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivigal. Maybe you're also Logos and Trivigal. While you're trying to figure that out, let me introduce, or I should say reintroduce today's special guest. I have with me Dr. Sean McFate, uh, the great and powerful author of The New Rules of War, a book which I've recommended ad nauseum to just about everybody who had listened to me. And uh, as you know, I am right in the midst of this series on war and who better to bring on than the man who has fought wars and advised wars and written the new rules of war. Uh, so with that, just very brief introduction, Sean, thank you for coming back on. And for those of my audience who didn't hear the first episode or aren't familiar with you, why don't you tell them a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. So currently, well, first of all, it's great to be back on your podcast. Um, and my current position, I'm a professor of strategy at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. This is where we teach our colonels who are going to become generals how to fight and win wars. I'm also a professor of strategy at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at, a, at the Atlantic Council, a think tank. But I wasn't always a, uh, you know, a professional thinker. I was also a doer. I was an officer in the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division, and then after that, I sort of, they say, hopped the fence and became a private military contractor, some would say mercenary in Africa and Eastern Europe, uh, and there I saw war in new ways, which helped contribute to this book called The New Rules of War, which is like, it's, it asks, why haven't we won a war since 1945, and suggests how we do so. And I'm also a novelist, and uh, I have a novel coming out. Uh, everything that doesn't go into the fiction, I mean, nonfiction goes into the fiction. So uh, multiple ways to get the ideas out. Yeah, and <laughs> no surprise that the wizard of strategy would have his own strategy about how to convey some of the ideas that maybe don't <laughs> pass the official <laughs> inspection. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's just that kind of thinking that I really wanted to – bring you back on to talk about because um, there's a lot there's a lot that goes into warfare that is pretty misunderstood by most of the population because uh, as you know and as most of the people listening to this podcast know most of the information that you're going to get about any given war is coming through the traditional media routes or even the alternative media routes and yeah. a lot of that is misinformation uh, whether intentionally incorrect or not or or maybe just uh there's a lot attached to the information that you're getting about a war or the results of a war or, or what's even actually happening and so i wanted to bring you on to really arm the people in understanding uh, what's really happening and how to how to understand how to look at what they're being told or what they're not being told and and what that actually means as far as what's going on with the war what's going on with the um, people who decide which wars we're going to fight and that kind of thing. And yeah. so I guess my first question is, um, if someone's sitting in front of you and, and you're a teacher, and I'm, I'm sure this is the case often, but if someone's sitting in front of you and they say, you know, Dr. McVeigh, I, uh, I'm coming to you with a beginner's mindset and I want you to sort of fill my vessel. How, how should I begin to understand this subject and, and, and what ties into it? And uh, how would you, how would you begin that conversation? I would say, first of all, don't fully believe everything you read in the newspaper and all the war experts in places like Washington, D.C. And the reason is, uh, it's not that they're trying to deliberately mislead people, but our, their knowledge of warfare is stuck in the past. Uh, there's an adage that generals always fight the last war, especially if they won it. This truism happens to be true. And in the case of the United States of America, our pair, our, the last war we really won was World War II. And in many ways, if you ask professional experts, defense experts, what they think the next war would look like against China or Russia or whomever, it's usually some version of World War II with better technology. And that's not the future war at all. In fact, I would, I would challenge you are we already at war with Russia and China and don't even know it? And that's part of their strategy. Because how can you fight and win a war if you don't even know you're at war? And war has changed. And that's the problem. Washington is stuck in the past with the Maginot Line mentality. 
Meanwhile, our enemies have innovated, adapted, and moved forward and passed us by. You know, as I mentioned before uh, we started recording, I, I just had Scott Adams on here, and, and I brought you up in that conversation, and I sort of proposed to him the idea of durable disorder, which I think we should get into here in a minute. But, yeah. you know, I basically asked him, do you, do you think it is the case that these, these big sort of traditional big bomb, big bullet wars are over with or mostly over with and that it's going to transition into information war and shadow war and more personal, smaller scale mercenary war. And he essentially agreed with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to maybe press him a little bit on the idea of, of war with China and Russia. And one thing he said, which I want to get your perspective on, he said, you know, there, he said, I think it's literally the case that there are zero people in the world who think that a traditional war with China or Russia is a good idea. We, we're the major nuclear powers, and that's not going to end well for anybody. It's going to be a disaster should it ever happen, and I don't think it ever will. But what you just said is, well, uh, we might not be having a big bomb war, but it's pretty hard to argue that we're not actually in this new modern form of warfare with information, with uh, attacks on sort of the cultural foundations of, of these nations, ourselves included. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of people, I think, and, and I want to get your perspective on this too, and then I'll kind of just let this sit here, is there's a lot of angst and frustration at the idea that maybe Russia or China are interfering with our culture, but it seems to me to be the case that it's not a one-way road, that that's a bi-directional thing that's going on, and maybe we're not as successful at it, maybe we are, maybe it's just the common perception that we're not doing that, but I just kind of wonder your take on, on those several ideas. Yeah, well, first of all, I like Scott Adams a lot. I like him because he, he asks hard questions that nobody wants to ask. <laughs> and aside from Dilbert, which is a genius comic strip, I mean, he's, he's uh, we need critical thinkers, and he is one of them. And even if we don't agree with critical thinkers, we should listen to them, and, and I certainly listen to, to Scott closely. Um, I would, I mean, here's the deal. When we think about war, we think about what we call conventional war, like these big bomb wars, World War II, right? War is going underground. The future of war is that war is getting sneakier and the cunning will win and not just the strong. And this is how Russia took the Ukraine. This is how China is taking the South China Sea. They're being cunning. And occasionally, uh, you know, wars are going to go underground, and we can talk about why that's the case and what it means for democracies, but wars going underground, occasionally when things get out of hand, it bubbles up to the surface. It bubbles up where mainstream media can see it, and they look at it through the lens of yesterday and say, that's conventional war. But that's, it's, it's, very, it's a very brief moment when it's conventional, and then it goes back underground where it's out of sight out of mind and that's how you win today it's through out of sight out of mind wars going to the complicated shadows so you know and the idea of like going in a sort of boots on the ground mode into china or russia or iran is insane and there are people in washington who want to do that like john bolton you know former national security stuff he's got a book coming out right what's it going to say uh the, the truth is is that it's it's suicide and worst case this is not isis or al-qaeda it could go into a, a shooting war with Russia, you know, it could go into a nuclear war in a sort of a 1914 Sarajevo moment of accidental war, except that, you know, Russia, we cannot forget, is still the only country in the world that can incinerate the United States of America in 30 minutes. We can laugh about certain things about the oligarchy, et cetera, but there's still an existential threat in a way that terrorists never were. A true existential threat is like the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's not 9-11. We've forgotten what it means to be scared. In some ways, that's, we're a victim of our own success as a country. We're entering a new era where other big great power competition, as they say, great powers are gunning for us. But it's not going to be with howitzers. It's going to be with things like influence, uh, malign influence, and media. Hmm. You know, that, that, ties, that ties nicely into a couple of the conversations that I've had on this subject, whether it's my friend, uh, pseudonym Atlas, in uh, working out of Morocco and, and doing things in Africa, or whether it was with Scott Adams again. 
one of the ideas that keeps popping up is the idea that this new media and, and these new influencers and this new capacity for, let's say, uh, you know, I put something out there that is insightful and, and clever, maybe humorous and salient to the moment, that, that one bit of information can find its way to thousands or millions of people almost instantaneously. And if I do that often enough, if I understand the formulas about how to manipulate information and manipulate viewpoints or persuade, then I can very rapidly become a person who people have to pay attention to because so many people are already paying attention to. And mm-hmm. I guess uh, I'm wondering from, from your vantage point, maybe when, when did you s- first start to notice or, or what cued you into the idea that this information warfare and this, this uh, sort of war of influence rather than a war of bullets uh, was entering into a period of primacy. And then to tack onto that, it, it seems to me to be the case uh, and very self-evidently that this is the infancy of this, mm-hmm. of this new paradigm. And I guess I wonder what you think the, the arc of this new paradigm is going to look like as we continue to travel into the future. Yeah, it's a great question. So really, we're, now we're talking really about the future of war. And uh, you know, I, I first noticed that about 10 years ago, when Israel fought a war in southern Lebanon against Hezbollah, a terrorist group, and Hezbollah won. Even though that, you know, under the old rules of war, Israel should have won. They killed more enemy, they captured more territory, they flew their flag over Hezbollah's territory. But Hezbollah won because they outcommunicated Israel. And Israel will tell you this too, they, they fully acknowledged they were beaten. And what we're seeing now, I mean, First of all, the role of propaganda is not new. Propaganda has always been a part of warfare. But what's different now, of course, is globalization and the sophistication to strategically weaponize it in ways that wasn't the case 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so war is now becoming epistemological. And what that means is this. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Like, How do you know what you know? It's perception versus reality. And in the old rules of war, winners were determined on battlefields. You know, you know, battles of like Waterloo, Stalingrad, Midway, Gettysburg. That's what determined winners and losers. In modern war, battlefield victory does nothing. I mean, let's not forget George W. Bush saying mission was accomplished after we battlefield victoried Iraq in 2003. And of course, it accomplished nothing. It's, it's become a meme for clueless failure. The way you win now is is in the information domain. You convince people, you mess with their perceptions of reality, and you get them to do things that serve your natural interests, even though they don't know they're doing it. And this is the power of of telecommunications and modern, you know, and trolls. And and so China, Iran, uh, Russia have invested heavily and their sort of internet trolling and bots and ways to, to confuse conversations online. And so we, those, we have to, modern warfare has now come down to people who can tell truth from lies. And you can't rely just on mainstream media because sometimes they are unwittingly part of it. We have to just become better critical thinkers. And this is the point, I think, of Scott Adams with his idea of what he calls loser think, right? I mean, it's like, it, it's incumbent upon us. And we, and there's, of course, there's no generational fixes. You can't say, well, if we need to have better education. That's kind of loser think too. We need to have technologies, not like better F-35 fighter pilot jets. We need technologies that may help us make wiser decisions about information that we see and read. For example, the problem of clickbait. I mean, you're, I'm sure your listeners know clickbait is a problem. What if we, we all wear clothes that have a label of, you know, this was made in China, this was made in Bangladesh, this was made in Vietnam. What if we could label clickbait made in Iran, made in Russia, or it explains to consumers where that stuff is coming from? Uh, would people be less inclined to fall for it? And I'll tell you why this malign influence war works is because... You know, who cares about the sword if you can influence the arm that wields it? So who cares about the military if you can try to sway, like, who's the commander in chief? And that's what Russia and China are doing to us right now. So let me, let me just sort of 
run run through a scenario with you, I think, right now. It might help illuminate some of what you're talking about. And it's actually a scenario that you outline in your book. If we if we look at the the annexation of Crimea by Russia, uh, what you had was a situation where and, and for anybody Anybody who's listening to this podcast, I think, is going to have an idea. Oh, well, you know, Russia wants to expand its influence, and and maybe it's just a regional power right now. But that's not the long it's not the long play. Uh, but okay, so it it sort of uses disinformation to point the fingers at a lot of different places and to confuse, and then it moves in with little green men, and maybe they're Russian, maybe they're not. Even if they are Russian, how can you prove it? And then right. it sort of just sows turbulence, sows chaos, sows confusion, um, and gets different parties distrusting each other. And then it preys on maybe some vestigial uh, sort of Russian nationalism that's present in the region, and, and then pits yeah. the people who hold on to that against the people who are more solidly in the gung-ho Ukrainian nationalism idea and it it draws lines and then it just confuses all this. And then by the time the little green men have moved in, by the time the the dust has settled, Crimea is in the hands of Russia and nobody can really trace back without paying very close attention, the genesis of how that all happened. But yet here it is in their hands. And, and maybe the people who were sounding the alarms at first were like, see, I told you, but there were a hundred to one people saying, well, we don't know what's going on or no, that's not going on. And maybe some of those were Russian assets in the first place. And so now it's like, okay, well, we won this one and there's nothing you can do about it because it's already in our hands. And, and if you, you know, it's, it's a new border for us now. And if you cross our border, there's going to be issues. And so I guess uh, maybe how accurate is that depiction and yeah. And, and what else might you want to add or, or yeah. zoom in on? So this is a great case study, Russia taking Ukraine. So let me explain. So in my book, The New Rules of War, I answer the question, why hasn't the U.S. won since 1945? And why does it struggle against low-level foes, even though we're the best military in the world? And, this, and, I, and I show this example. So in the old rules of war, think of a conventional war, World War II, think of the Soviets in the Cold War. When the Soviets in the Cold War wanted to put their boot on somebody's neck, the way they did it is they rolled in the tanks, right? Think of Hungary in 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968, and they literally kicked ass, right? Now when they want to do that, say Ukraine, they don't roll in the tanks. I mean, they could have. They could have blitzkrieged Ukraine easily. Their military was 10 times what Ukraine's military was. And Ukraine's not a part of NATO, so don't have to worry about that. And, but they didn't do that. They played by the new rules of war. What they did is they, they won in the information domain. Uh, they used, how did they do that? They, they created the fog of war and exploited it for victory. What they did was not using, you know, not airplanes and tanks, they used covert forces like Spetsnaz special forces. They used mercenaries like the Wagner Group. They use little green men. They had what they call these astroturfed proxy militias. Astroturfing is when you have like fake grassroots and they have like these Russian separatists, but they were completely pawns of the Kremlin. Uh, And they had loads of propaganda, which they call active measures. And what they did is they created this fog of war and a ghost occupation force to keep Western policymakers are trying to think like what's really going on there what should our what should our policy response be i mean how can you go into a war if you don't know the basic facts of the war there's no pearl harbor moment with this thing and so by the time western powers had figured it all out crimea was a fait accompli it was already done and only then did the conventional war weapons like tanks and destroyers show up and this is a magnificent example of how modern wars are fought they're fought, they're won uh, in the secret domain of, of fog of war. And, you know, we need to get sneaky too. Uh, so this is, Ukraine is it's what's to come because other countries around the world are observing this and saying, ah, so that's how you win. And they're going to imitate it. So Ukraine is only a taste of what's before us. So let me, let me propose another a recent scenario and then maybe we can get the the Sean McFate perspective on it yeah. and uh, it's it's the new uh, sort of Israel US slash 
Middle East uh, situation where essentially my understanding, and I watched the news conference and did a little research afterwards, and it goes like this. Um, Israel says, we're going to do what we're doing, and you can't do anything about it, and we're going to continue to occupy the places that we're at, and we're going to consider that Israel now. And the U.S. has agreed to consider that Israel too. Yeah. So here's some steps that you can take to join the international community or not. We don't care. We're just going to do what we're doing. And you've got four years to decide what you want to do about it. And then we're going to yeah. start encroaching on you again. And you, your area can stay what it is or it can shrink. And that's just how we're going to play the game. And yeah. so uh, that's, that's sort of the official word. Is, yeah. You know, they came right out and just basically said that. And so I guess yeah. what, what, is the, what is the way to look at this a little more critically? So interesting. When I wrote the new rules of war, I took a year off. And I, did, I was a, uh, a fellow at Oxford University, but I spent three months as a faculty member at Israel's War College doing research into shadow wars going on in Syria and Iraq. And I spent, just so you know, my background's in national security. I spent my entire career avoiding the Israel-Palestine issue because it's such a tar pit, right? You got to come yeah. down clearly on one versus the other. I just didn't want to touch, touch it, really. Um, and, but, you know, I, I kind of got sucked in and uh, I learned a lot, um, uh, you know, not, I learned a lot about that region uh, and, and also America's strange special relationship with Israel. Uh, I will say this, without coming down on the side of pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, because they both have their merits and they have demerits, frankly, is that Israel won that war long ago. Okay, and what this peace treaty is, it's not even a peace treaty. It's funny thing is people use the word peace when they really mean victory. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I want peace in the Middle East. Uh, that is what this is, is that, and the U.S. under Trump is just acknowledging what a lot of people in the region, including Arab countries, know to have been true for a very long time, is that Israel won. That's it. Israel won. And, um, and it shows, and they won initially by a war of conquest in the, in the late 40s, and then a war of repression. Um, but they have won. And this is, this is the, the sort of, a, Trump is saying it's their last final best deal. You know, it may be, it may not be, but I don't see, beyond rhetoric, I don't see Arab countries sort of clamoring for the Palestinian side, as you saw like 50 years ago. And that's what the Palestinians need. Uh, and part of that is because the Middle East is a dumpster fire right now. So it's not, <laughs> the, the, you know, the Arab countries have their own issues in Syria and Iraq and against Iran and et cetera. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I think we should read this as a uh, declaration of victory, not a declaration of peace. That's very interesting. And uh, I can appreciate the, the caution with which you navigated yeah. those uh, sort of <laughs> rocky waters. Um, Here's another just in, and it wasn't necessarily on the agenda, but I wonder your your thoughts on this matter, which is there's been a lot of speculation and finger pointing recently uh, as to the amount of influence or interference that uh, Qatar has been exerting on the United States media and and government operations uh, and I've done a little research, but I don't feel like I'm in a position to understand uh, that situation very well. And I wonder maybe you could help illuminate me on that. I can illuminate a little bit. So Qatar is an interesting country. Uh, I mean, that the Gulf states in general, there's a lot of micro, it's, it's, it's unfair to say micro politics, but there's a lot of intricate politics with a lot of history that are, are opaque to the casual American observer. Um, and the, in, in Qatar's relationships with Iran are also quite intriguing. Um, I'll say this, is that in general, we're entering an era of, in the old days, like the old rules of war, alliances were basically terrest terrest uh, terrestrial, like states. Like, well, I'm a, you're an ally of mine, France. Uh, you're, an, you're an enemy of mine, Russia. In modern warfare, you can be an ally with a country on a ground war but an enemy of a country in the cyber domain. And the Emirates is an example of this. And so old school people think, well, 
we're kind of aligning with the Emirates against Iran and the Persian Gulf, so they're our, our allies. And the answer is yes, in the shooting wars on the ground like Yemen uh, and against Iran on the ground, that is true. But in the cyber and information domains, they are not our friends at all. And they're, they're like every country, they're playing multiple sides of every problem. Uh, and so there is, in general, that is what's going on with Qatar and the Emirates writ large. Um, but I think the, the actual nuances of this specific incident, I, I couldn't shed any more light on that. That, what you just said, I think is, is useful to transition into another concept, which is, Traditionally, like you said, an alliance, okay, here's France and here are the neat borders and here's the United States and here are the neat borders and, and now we're allies. Uh, but, and the Middle East is, and, and Africa especially, this would be the case. Those, those lines are not necessarily quite so starkly drawn. There's a lot of blurring. There's, there's sort of cultural boundaries and then there's financial interest boundaries and there's historical boundaries and, and different grudges and different cultures and things. And so if you look at, say, um, we're at war with Iran, uh, just as a hypothetical, yeah. well, what is, what is Iran? Is it, right. is it that country that's got the lines or is it all the proxy stuff they're doing all over the place? Or is it uh, more of a religious thing or, or a cultural thing? And then how far do those borders extend and, and what are their boundaries? And so I guess, uh, Maybe you could help us understand a little bit more about how regional influence or cultural influence doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. respect the, the lines drawn on a map. Right. Exactly right. So in, in, again, old rules of war thinking, it's like a game of risk where there's neat boundaries with nation states and only nation states control international politics. That world is done. Okay. Uh, we're going back to a world that's a lot more organic and messy and wild, which is kind of what it was like, like in the Middle Ages or antiquity, where it's not just states and their, their kings or presidents, it's also super empowered individuals, wealthy families, in our case, corporations, there's cultural things. And that is what's going on in the Middle East. If you look at the Middle East through the lens of boundaries and borders, it'll make no sense. It'll just be a mess. But if you look at it, you, know, you take states out of it and look at, for example, this is a little simplistic, but there's been an ancient war that's been going on there for 1400 years between who owns the soul of Islam that started at the deathbed of Prophet Muhammad. And there's a Sunni version and there's a Shia version and they've been waging a war that has nothing to do with the pre-states, during states and post-states for 1400 years. Sometimes that war has gone hot, sometimes it's gone cold, it's often in the shadows, which is part of the new rules of war. And that is what Iran has been doing in, in Syria as a, as a shadow battlefield. It's not, you know, it's, it's when we killed General Soleimani, that was one of the, I think one of the best moves we've done recently. Because he was like the general pattern of this new way of war. He was, he was much more dangerous than, uh, than al-Baghdadi or Osama bin Laden. And just so you know who he is, he is the Iranian general who kind of became their general of shadow warfare. And he sort of created and, and manipulated things like Hezbollah, uh, and not Hezbollah just in Lebanon, which is very powerful, but Hezbollah in Iraq, uh, Quds special forces, all these shadowy things. He was the military genius behind. And, um, and that is how war has, and, and we call this, what's well, the king of Jordan once called it the Shia Crescent. If you look, if you take away the, if you look at the Middle East and take away the boundaries of states, because they're kind of not useless, but they're half the story. And you look at this cult, this clash of civilizations, these word of Sam Huntington, um, the Shia influence goes from Lebanon through parts of Syria into Iraq and into Iran, and then comes out the other end in like Yemen and places like that. Um, and the Sunni Shia split is, is, you know, it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's the general battlefield right there. And it has nothing to do really with state politics. Right now, the Ayatollahs in Iran are like the, the captains of the Shia team. And you might say that the, the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia is the captains of the 
SUNY team, although that's extremely facile and simplistic, but it gives your listeners an idea of a better way to think about the Middle East. Okay. And obviously the United States has a, a preference or, or at least has stronger ties to one side than the other. It does. Um, yeah. yeah. So we could, uh, we could go on and on about the Middle East and we'd never run out of things to talk about, but I'd like to transition yeah. a little bit because um, you have experience in Africa and there's a lot going on there that is pretty important, especially yeah. down the road. Uh, China is investing very heavily in trying to extend their influence and, and creating a lot of logistics right. uh, capabilities there. And, and um, it seems to me to be the case, although I could easily be mistaken, that we have maybe not as much attention being paid to, to African stuff because of our um, sort of fascination with Russia and China at the moment. And I, I wonder... Uh, maybe where you see the pinch points uh, moving yeah. forward in, in the African domain and, and maybe maybe you could just paint a little bit of a picture for us about what's going on over there. Sure. So, I mean, I spent years living and working in Africa as a private military contractor uh, and seeing kind of the worst of humanity and the worst of politics. And uh, this is some background in Africa because most Americans, it's not on a radar screen. Africa is a lost continent and it has a lot of problems. It's also a big continent. You could put three United States of Americas safely in Africa. That's how big it is. And what's been happening is that China has been making major inroads into Africa for at least 15 years. They have this thing called One Belt, One Road Initiative for the whole world. And it sort of seems like we're gonna you know, have economic policy, we're gonna spread our economic wings and fly, but it's also a national security strategy. It's a security strategy. And what they do is they try to, they're like Tony Soprano for other countries. Uh, like the mob, like you know, Tony Soprano from like the mob. Yeah, he's like, you know, hey, I'll give you a short term loan with no strings attached. If you want to do like mass murder, that's okay. We're not going to be like European countries or America and hold you accountable. But if you fail to default, we're taking something. And they did this with Sri Lanka. Sri, they, we, they took Sri Lanka's prize port. It's like they took Sri Lanka's port of LA or port of Newark because they defaulted on a loan, right? Uh, and so other, and that they're doing this all across Africa and uh, they're trying to create, they're trying to get countries, they're giving them gifts and giving them things, but they're creating debt, not just financial debt, but like debt of favors like you get in a mob. And they're gonna use that for strategic advantage. Uh, and it's not just China, Russia's doing very simple, well, they're doing something different. They're also, Russia is getting more and more expeditionary into Russia like they did during the Cold War, but they're using mercenaries like the Wagner Group. Their Wagner Group is in Central African Republic, they're in Libya, they're in the Congo. They're doing the things I used to do, frankly, for the US government, which is, we can't talk about all of it, but we, you know, they're trying to professionalize local forces or taking down strongmen, they're propping up strongmen stuff like that. They're getting very involved. And places like Libya matter because Libya, first of all, is on Europe's doorfront. Libya has a lot of sweet crude oil. And Libya is also, if you want to put pressure on the EU, if you're, if you're the Kremlin, one great way to do that is weaponizing refugees. And we've seen them do, Russia do this in Syria, and they could do this in Libya. What they'll do is they'll open up the spigot for like illegal immigrants from Africa, from war zones to flood into Italy and flood into EU. And that will get the EU's attention. So that's an example of the new rules of war. You weaponize things that you didn't think could be weaponized. And has, of course it's immoral. They don't care, but they've done this before. So Africa is right now also a plenty of shadow battlegrounds that the US has completely taken its eye off the ball. And this is a huge risk to us. Yeah, and, and a couple of just points to tie into what you're saying there. It seems to me that um, what China is doing as far as the resource grab is a little bit different than how the United States has played the game because the United States was uh, maybe putting in a favored dictator and then asking for favors. You know, we get the sweet deal yeah. and China's just saying, no, it's, we're going to take the, whole, the actual land, the actual resource. It's just ours now. We own it. That's right. Like colonialism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, but, you know, um, 
a little bit sneakier than the sort of overt, like we've planted our flag. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's more like a, it's the mafia model is what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, hey, exactly. not for nothing, but uh, this yeah. is ours now. <laughs> yeah, exactly and, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and since China doesn't have a lot of daughters, there's not a daughter's wedding to ask for right. favors back, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, yeah. I, I just, one question I have here is, you, you mentioned the, refu the weaponization of refugees, and, and obviously another facet of that is sort of the cultural shift, and, and one could sort of maybe take a look at how much influence the idea of we should welcome all refugees has been intentionally implanted into the minds of um, many European countries, and we could yeah. take a look at the work of Antonio Gramsci and cultural right. Marxism and stuff like that, but that's, that's, a, that's a big can of worms. I'll just <laughs> sort of leave that for people and they can think about it. But given that that's been so successful and that there's Libya and there's, there's all kinds of turbulence still. Yeah. What would, what would a sound strategy for the United States or for Europe be to, to counteract both the cultural and then the actual bodies migrating to, to slow the role of that yeah. very successful operation? So it's a great question. A big one. I mean, Right now, just to, to back up a bit, one of my new rules of war, rule number 10, is there's only 10 new rules. The last one is that victory is fungible. And what that means, something that's fungible is something that's swappable, like money. You can exchange it freely. The old rules of war, you think of victory as like battlefield victory, the end of World War II, et cetera. In the new rules of war, there's many ways of winning. And one way of winning is to is not to blitzkrieg a country, but or to even do like Russia's ghost occupation is to reach in to advanced telecommunications and stir up debates and, and, and muck around in domestic politics for your own national interests in a covert way. And I think that's what's happening. Like inf information warfare is what's going on, political warfare. And it's not just messaging, it's potentially through immigration. And, uh, and, and this is not, um, and just, there's a background to this. So when I was in, in Africa, working as a so-called military contractor. One of my, I was in the Great Lakes region for a, a mission, and this is like Rwanda, Burundi, the Congo, and it's, it's, it's where the genocide took place. It's one of the, the worst spots on the earth, the most horrendous atrocities on earth in our lifetime. And um, it, one of the tricks that countries would do was is during an election, send waves of immigrants uh, across the border to vote and then have them come back. Uh, and so there's many ways to rig elections, right? And it's not just a new thing through technology, there's many ways to do it. Now, I'm not gonna suggest that that's what's going on in Mexico and our country. I mean, but I, the point I'm saying is that um, <laughs> there, there, there is precedent for this type of, of thing and, and at least to create a debate around it, some of which is a good debate, some of which can be a toxic debate. And what we know right now is that, you know, we know that democracies are messy and that occasionally, you know, if we're having a family feud as a, as a country and this culture where we're having, and it's, it's, it's authentic, that's fine. But what's happening is you have foreign powers reaching into our country, finding the seams of our society and ripping them apart and then fanning those flames. That's warfare. Okay, whether you want to call it an act of war or not is up to you. I think it's an irrelevant question, but it's a way of winning because again, who cares about the sword if you can, you know, manipulate the hand that wields it? Who cares about, you know, military warfare if you can corrode a society from the inside out? And I think that is what our enemies are trying to do to America because they know they can't win against us on the battlefield, but they don't need to. They can win against us inside the home front. And I think that's where modern war has taken us. Sort of like the idea of the pen is mightier than the sword, but the tweet is mightier than the pen. That's right. The tweet is mightier than the house around. Yes. Yeah. So here's another maybe branch of my curiosity, which is given that the United States and so many other Western countries are so fractious right now, culturally, politically, uh, with the rise of populism and the rise of socialism again, and, and sort of that, that perennial disagreement. Um, I guess 
and 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 to be frank the the idea of durable disorder being a more personal sort of warfare than the giant nation state grand wars to end all wars kind of an idea right how much of the potential progress or the potential negation or or victory of these sorts of uh, informational or shadow wars could be influenced not by the country or the, the say the CIA or, or somebody like this, but by uh, an individual with a lot of money and connections that, that yeah. reaches out to that network and says, Hey, this is, this is the thing that I want to see. And, and here's, and here's our party line. Here's our party message. And here's the methods that we use to sort of sow this information or disinformation. I mean, where do you see that balance in the information sphere, yeah. not necessarily just in the, in the kinetic yeah. sphere? So uh, there is no balance. <laughs> so, Durable disorder is an idea I talk about in the book, The New Rules of War. And what it means is that we've known for 30 years that states around the world are retreating. Uh, they're hollowing out, they're becoming failed states, they're just regimes inside of states. I mean, look across Africa, look across the Middle East, look across Latin America, look across South Asia. States everywhere are weakening and some are just disappearing. I mean, Syria is disappearing, right? I mean, no matter, you can put boundaries on a map, but that don't make it a state, you know? So uh, what, what's left in the wake of this is something I, I call durable disorder. It's not like anarchy. It's not the nights of me or the sky is falling and rest in more sky. What it is, it's, it's more like, again, like the, the closest analogy might be like the Middle Ages, where it's just, it's disorder, but it doesn't totally collapse, but it doesn't totally come together. It just like grinds on. Uh, and there's overlapping allegiances and alliances and overlapping of everything. Everything gets muddier. Uh, and in this era, states are no longer, the world that we grew up in sixth grade, learning about how states control the world and international law and only states can wage war, that world is evaporating. It's going back to what it used to be, which is when states were nothing special. It was a very crowded world stage. And in my, in that world, you know, if you look at my book, The New Rules of War, rules six and seven are together. Rule six is that mercenaries are returning because you don't have powerful national armies to put them down. And when mercenaries return, and we see them everywhere, Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Nigeria, Venezuela, you know, all over Africa, elsewhere. And they show, these are not like lone guys in the jungle with a Kalishnikov. These are special operations units. These are helicopter attack gunships. These are SEAL team things. I mean, these are high, high impact, very sophisticated, paramilitaries are no longer villains from Hollywood. And what that means is that suddenly the super rich can use them and wage war for any reason they want. And now the super rich can become a superpower and they are in regions around the world. So whether it's like the 0.001% or ExxonMobil gets its own army, or maybe a megachurch hires mercenaries to do a humanitarian intervention. The idea is that warfare is no longer just a thing of states. It's becoming, if you will, democratized. And in a world also that mercenaries, I mean, this is supply and demand. The supplier are these, are like very rich people or rich organizations, demand are mercenaries and they ratchet each other up. And, a, and mercenaries also start wars for profit, elongate wars for profit, and oh, by the way, international law is of no use to them. Those people who say, well, international law will take care of this are dreaming because mercenaries can shoot your law enforcement dead. They're the one commodity that cannot be regulated because, you know, think about it. who's gonna go into Yemen and arrest all those mercenaries? You know, the Marine Corps, the United Nations, nobody's gonna do it. Uh, so we're gonna see this trend of mercenaries grow. And as they grow, you're gonna see this demand, the, the clientele will, will start to, to grow as well. And it won't just be states, It'll be super rich people and super rich organizations. And now wars will be fought for all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with patriotism. And you might have, there might have been a case if there were one or two sort of small mercenary organizations in one or two places in the world and you just go boot stomp them. And it's like, well, it's problem solved. But yeah. since it's everywhere all the time, even, right. even with, the, with the, the most powerful military in the world, it's neutralized by the fact that you can't be everywhere all the time and and right. even if you could 
the places, a lot of these places wouldn't want you there in the first place. Well, also you can get sucked into a war there. It's not yeah. like you can like quickly lightning strike and get out of there and problem solve. You could do a lightning strike, but it may not solve, it probably won't solve the problem long term. Um, and if you stay and stick around, then the risks of you getting sucked into a mission creep situation, it'll be like, it could be like Afghanistan. Um, so we have to, you know, this is the problem. And it's also mercenaries now exist in basically three different, this is how the mercenary world works. It's, it's an illicit economy. It's around the, the three big groups. There are the Russian speakers, the English speakers, and the Spanish speakers. And there's some smaller ones, like the French speakers, the Polish speakers, and Hebrew speakers, and stuff like that. But there's these three speakers, and, uh, and the command languages for these groups. And they, it's all it's a word of mouth industry. You can't really advertise it. Like, going to go to Libya, took over an oil field, you know, apply online. It's like, who do you know? <laughs> you know? So, it, you know, so what's happened, this is growing in the shadows. And mercenaries give you really good plausible deniability. And this is the future of wars because we live in an information age where, again, plausible deniability is more important than firepower. And that's why special forces are always used. That's why proxies are always used. That's why mercenaries are growing is they could do they're like give you beautiful plausible deniability because if something really goes badly you don't have to rescue them unlike a seal team if a seal team gets captured or killed you got to send somebody to rescue them but if a mercenary group gets captured they'll just write them off that's just the way it is so that's why we're seeing everybody using mercenaries more and more especially russia now they're very aggressively using mercenaries hmm. okay so as we've been talking here I, we've We've gone to the Middle East, very sticky situation. We've gone to Africa, very sticky situation. We've talked about sort of the, the cultural aspects and the political aspects, which are all sticky. It's, it's sort of one big sticky mess. It's like all the spaghetti stuck to the wall when we threw it, I guess. Yeah. Um, and number one, I, I really want to reiterate that I think folks should just go pick up your book and read it because a lot of the things we've been talking about will... Uh, become very clear by by going through and actually getting into yeah. the details and, and the examples and things but but number two is i i suppose it's it's now that we've got the context of this conversation i want to kind of return to that initial question which is mm -hmm. you know how, how how should a person how should a person two parts how should a person maybe who wants to do their best to stay out of this or to to be reasonable about what they're being told, but not to sort of try to influence it. How should they approach this? And then if there are people out there who maybe have a desire to make an influence, maybe you could, maybe you could illuminate both ends of that question there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, look, I wrote this book for them and, and this book is written. It's not a dry academic tome. It's written like a vanity fair article or a, it's like a, like a magazine article that's easy to, to go down like ice cream, but the ideas are really rigorous and very strong. And, but it's so that I wrote it so my mother could understand it. She knows nothing about any of this stuff. Uh, and the reason is this, is that for those who want to avoid it, there's an old saying that you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And you can avoid it for so long. Look at how, you know, World War II started for the English or for the French, for that matter. They got blitzkrieg, they got surprised. So if you don't want to be surprised, because I think a surprise could be coming down the pike, you know, read the book. Uh, I don't mean this in an imminent way, Hans. I, I just mean that I think that there are, we could already be at war with China and Russia, and they have a strategy of deception to keep us from knowing about it until it's too late. It's like, their strategy is like boiling frogs slowly. Uh, it's you do it, by the time you realize you're boiled, it's too late. Nothing against frogs in that. Um, those, <laughs> those, those who, who are interested in, in foreign affairs and, 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 international, and warfare, read the book. The book is like a new set of goggles. When you put the book on your face and you look out the, through the lens of the book, it'll change the landscape. It'll change how you understand international relations. Now, whether you agree with that, that's fine. That's, that's your decision. But I guarantee it'll be provocative and thought provoking. It'll, it'll, It'll give you with a, a new perspective of how to look at international relations. And I think you'll have a lot of aha moments. And you'll see a lot of problems with how Washington is going about the business of national security. 
We spent two trillion dollars. <laughs> yeah, at least. At least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so I th- I think from my end we've done a pretty good job of painting painting the picture and and using some scenarios and using some examples to to help make it real. Are there any are there any aspects or are there any questions you feel like you'd like to be asked but you aren't asked? Are there any pieces of the sort of the ideas that we're missing that you think are important that maybe ought you know, to be there, expressed? There's so many. Um, there's not a single idea. I would say, I would say this is that um, I give this talk a lot in, in defense circles and not just in Washington, but also in the UK and in Europe and in, in the, the Pacific, the Asia countries. And there's a generational rift going on around the world between people who grew up, who are senior leaders now, who grew up when in the Cold War and in the world of sort of politics as we grew up learning about it, between strong nation states and their militaries and conventional war. And then there's a younger generation of people who don't see that at all. They see that as kind of in the rear view mirror. And what they see is more like the new rules of war. And the problem we have, there's a saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast Hmm. and that strategic ideas no matter how good they are are often ignored because they come into conflict with somebody's sort of paradigm or their strategic cultural understanding of things so we have some if you will an old guard across not just the united states but across a lot of countries that i think are very dangerous uh, because they could be sleepwalking us into problems. Not all of them. There are some very notable exceptions. I think, for example, Stanley McChrystal is a general of the U.S. Army who really sees things in new ways. I think special operations forces generally do too. And there's some others. It's not just, I'm not going to make a, I'm not trying to paint a picture that everybody who's over a certain age is useless. Not at all. But there's a certain predominance about it that, you know, maybe it's a, you know, there's a, it's a rising generation and I would encourage, I'm trying to encourage like an intellectual insurgency within the U S national defense ranks, not, not a, not as a real rebellion, to just be clear, not as a, but as a metaphor, like trying to, and a lot of people are coming forward and saying, yeah, your book, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, what I was thinking all along, but you just put words to it. And I totally agree. Uh, and I'm hearing this a lot from people who are, um, you know, vets of Iraq and Afghanistan and, and stuff like that. So uh, there's a lot of people out there uh, who are younger who, who I think get it. And then there's a few uh, in the old guard who, who will never get it. Um, and, you know, it's over time, they will retire, they will, they will dissipate. But, um, but this is reasons to be hopeful and not dread, dreadful. Very good. I guess, and this is sort of just not really relevant, but it's just a point of curiosity that I have. Is it, is it a very strange reality for you to have been sort of like the, the architect of doom? And then, and then now you're this like mild mannered professor type guy who's like, Hey guys, you know, maybe you could think (laughs) about things a little differently. It's such a, it's such a remarkable juxtaposition. No, my, my life is uh, sort of full of that. I, I, I have a really strange career path. I tell people I meet like, yeah, I have career ADD. Uh, I, I, um, I had this, this moment, uh, this low moment uh, in, in Africa on a mission I was doing. And um, I looked up and I realized that there were no old people in my business. Uh, they just disappeared. <laughs> and I realized maybe I need to rethink some of my life choices. Uh, and I sort of came back and ended up doing a PhD and, you know, going to Harvard, all these different things. The point, though, is, is that it made me see war in a new way. And I think that's what people who see, you know, who, people who see the future often see the past, but they see it in a different way based on some strange and relevant experiences, but that are not in the norm. They're not like in the paradigm. And so when I came back to Washington, I was kind of like, this is, I think, the future of war. People like saying you're a kook, that's ridiculous. But more and more people are like, yeah, I think, I think, you know, that's onto it. And what people say is I don't agree with everything you have to say, but I agree with most of it. And then a lot of people then say I agree with even more of it. But the point is I'm not trying to make Sean McVay clones. 
the point is I'm trying to get people to think about war in a new and different way so we can have the national discourse that we desperately need to have about what is war, what, how do we win, are we already at war? And if so, how do we defend ourselves? Because our enemies are manipulating how we think about war and using it against us. It's like strategic jujitsu, using the enemy's weight against them. And I think that's what our enemies are doing. Hmm. I think that's a pretty good place to leave it. There's, right. that's, that's, a, that's a pretty, that's a solid hook to the jaw right there. And I, I like that. I like the idea of just leaving it there. So, right. so look, uh, number one, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on. I know you're a busy man and I got a lot of things that you're doing and um, making the Logos and Trivable podcast. One of them is greatly appreciated. And I know my audience appreciates it too. Uh, number two is why don't you remind people where they can find you on the social media, uh, remind them the name of the book and where they can find that. And I, you mentioned at the top of the conversation that you've got some fiction coming out. Why don't you, why don't you yeah. drop the title on us and tell us about that too a little bit. So the, uh, my nonfiction book, this came out in paperback, is called The New Rules of War. Uh, and it, you can find it on Amazon, uh, Kindle, there's an audio book. Uh, in Europe, it's called Goliath, Why the West Does Not Win and What We Can Do, to, what we can do About It. Uh, and it's, again, it's a very readable, but very powerful treatise on war, about war and how to win modern and future wars. Now, everything that doesn't go into the non, nonfiction goes into the fiction. I'm also a novel writer. I write in this, in this sort of like Tom Clancy-like novels, but they are really thinly veiled reality. Uh, and my, my third book is coming out on June 9. It's called High Treason. Uh, James Patterson, a famous best-selling novel, novelist, just said I was like, it's the new Tom Clancy. Uh, I think your readers will love it. Uh, because it's a great, uh, some of the ideas and new rules of war are baked into the novel, but it's an easy B treat uh, or a, an airport read uh, and a lot of fun. Uh, you can find me on my website, seanmcbait.com. You can get all my books on Amazon. They're, they're all, they're, again, they're Kindle, they're in audiobooks, uh, and I frequently go around the country on bookstores. So hope maybe I'll meet you in person. Yeah, I certainly like that. And what are the names of the first two books in that series? So the first book is called Shadow War, and it takes place in, during the war in Ukraine in 2015, and it's a very accurate, it's based on reporting, shall we say. Uh, it's a very accurate rendition of how that war looks. So anybody wants to examine how Russia took the Ukraine, but sort of from a fun novel perspective, read Shadow War. The second book is called Deep Black. It takes place deep inside the ISIS caliphate. Same thing based on real reporting. If you want to see you know, how it really happens, read the book Deep Black. It's a fictionalized version of reality. A lot of fun. Uh, and you'll learn something at the end of the day too. Very good. Well, look, I, I think people are going to be able to find you. Like I said, I, I for the tenth time this conversation go pick up the new rules of war and read it you won't regret it uh, and all the people i've recommended it to have picked it up have felt the same and uh, look if you're good i'm good great thanks so much chance yeah it's my pleasure uh, and in that case this has been the logos and Trippable podcast i've been chance lunsford he's been dr sean mcfay and this has all been allegedly and we're out